Welcome to this installment of Conversation with the Masters. I am Brian Jones. Over the past year, we have been featuring discussions with the pioneers and thought leaders within the business valuation and financial forensics professions. With this installment of Conversation with the Masters, we bring to you the legendary Dr. Shannon Pratt. He invited us to Portland, Oregon, into his office and into his home, where for the first time he candidly discussed all of the contributions he has made through the wealth of books, articles, resources, and lectures that he has presented around the globe. There's a lot that we can say, but let's just get right to it. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Shannon Pratt. Well, Dr. Pratt, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brian. How are you? Fine, thank you. We are so honored to be able to spend some time with you. Thank you so much for, for making time for us. Well, thank you for making the trip. Yeah. All the way here to Portland from, from Salt Lake City to your offices here in Beaverton. Yes. Um, very much surrounded by the beauty of Portland. Um, great lunch we had as well. <laughs> so. We really are looking to spend some time with you to talk about your amazing career in this profession. Um, before it really was a profession, you really got the ball rolling with publications and training and, and so instrumental in credentialing for many of the organizations. But as a young man, before you got into your career, um, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, um, your family, um, those kinds of things. Well, I was born in Seattle, and uh, my family moved to Bainbridge Island when the war started. And we lived on Bainbridge Island until 1946, mm -hmm. at which time we moved to Portland. And uh, uh, I graduated from Grant High School here in Portland. And uh, then I went to Willamette University in Salem, Oregon for two years. And uh, then I graduated from the University of Washington mm -hmm. back up in Seattle. And so uh, then I uh, uh, worked for my dad in the food brokerage business for a while. and. Uh, uh, then I was in the Navy uh, uh, for three years and four months, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> uh, but um, I decided the food brokerage business was not for me, and my greatest ambition in life was to become the dean of a business school. Mm -hmm. So I started teaching career uh, at Portland State University, uh, and little did I know you had to have advanced credentials to teach. Mm -hmm. So I got my master's, well, I did my master's work at night school in the University of Oregon Extension Program. And uh, on the basis of that, I got a Ford Foundation Fellowship mm. to take anywhere I wanted. And so I chose Indiana University, which had a, a finance department that, that uh, suited me. Mm -hmm. And I majored in investments uh, at Indiana University. I took a leave from Portland State and, and uh, 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 my doctorate dissertation in Indiana University was a relationship between risk and rate of return. Okay. And that was a hot topic mm. then because I was the first a student outside of the University of Chicago to use the University of Chicago research tapes for research. Hmm. So I presented my dissertation at the University of Chicago. This was in 66. I finished my dissertation. And uh, the University of Chicago Center for Research and Security Prizes. Uh, so they were very interested in that. Hmm. And got you out there. Yeah. So Bainbridge, tell us about what it was like there when you grew up. Well, it was, uh, we had three quarters of an acre. So we had, there was a, like a huge spread to a, mm -hmm. to a little kid. And uh, I was from eight to 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I built forts out in the yard and uh, uh, my dad got me uh, a Lionel train set when I was six. and. Uh, got me another one when I was seven, and when I was eight, 
they weren't making them anymore because of the war. Okay. So he got me a used one. Mm -hmm. So I had the the tracks running all over the living room, and <laughs> it was a big house and big spread out ranch house. And right. Did you have brothers and sisters? No, just you. Know, only, only child. So that was really, um, since you still have a love for trains, it was your dad who originally uh, um, gave you those gifts that have become so important to you even still, huh? Yes. Do you remember what, I remember when I had some of those train sets when I was a little kid. I mean, what, was, what were some of the cars and how big was that original train set of yours? Well, the, the, the uh, uh, scale was 1 to 48, okay. which it still is for O gauge. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the uh, I had uh, three engines and um, probably over over twenty cars and uh, track that went all over the big living room. <laughs> Were you really close to your dad? Yeah. And then you guys moved to Portland. Yeah. Tell us about tell us about that when you moved here. Well, uh, we moved here because my dad had offices and. Uh, Seattle, Spokane, Tacoma, and Portland, mm -hmm. but he was a national uh, sales agency for uh, certain packers. Uh, we sold carloads of frozen strawberries and uh, grape juice and uh, filberts and that sort of thing all over the country. Uh, to uh, so um, he felt that 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 uh, this location would be better for him for his business. Mm -hmm. Did you like moving from there to here? Well, yeah, I liked it fine. I mean, uh, I uh, 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 went back up to Seattle for a couple of years in the seventh and eighth grades to go to Lakeside School, and mm -hmm. and uh, there was a boarding school, and and uh, now I made good friends down here, and uh, found a, uh, my best friend uh, uh, who died of cancer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, like Lionel trains too. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were magical. I, I don't know if they make those kinds of things like they did for kids nowadays, like they did back. Well, then. they're getting back into it. Yeah. Do you share any of those um, gifts and treasures with your grandkids? Well, uh, the uh, one grandson, uh, Randall, uh, is very into trains. Is he? And uh, he uh, knows how to run my layout. Mm -hmm. uh, masterfully. Mm -hmm. uh, he can do it better than I can. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, the grandkids are, are not very into trends. <laughs> You've got ten grandkids. Yes. Uh, with four kids. Yes. Yeah, all over um, the U.S., back east and still here in, in Portland area. Yes, the two boys are still here in Portland, and uh, one girl is living in Springfield, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Her husband works for the State Department, and the other girl lives in uh, uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Her husband is the uh, head of the philosophy department at the University of Arkansas. Oh, very but good. the, the, the uh, girls are both indeed in, in ordained Presbyterian ministers, hmm. and the one in Arkansas uh, has a church of her own, a little one outside of uh, Fayetteville, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the older one uh, is a full-time mom. Wow. Did, did any, besides your daughters, did any of your kids get into the accounting or finance profession? No. Nope, not at all, huh? No, not at all. <laughs> so you um, graduated from high school here in Portland. Yes. And you went into the Navy. Yes. How did you make the decision to enlist in the Navy? Tell well, us about it. Well, there was a draft then. Okay. And it was a, a choice between being a, a foot soldier for two years or being uh, an officer uh, on a Navy mm -hmm. ship for three years and four months, and I chose to be the officer. Right, <laughs> right. Did you travel much with? your position in the Navy, your time with the Navy? Well, I met my wife in Athens, Georgia at the Navy Supply Corps School, mm -hmm. which all Navy officers, all supply officers, had to go to mm -hmm. at that time. And uh, the, the, uh, my ship was stationed in uh, uh, Pier 99 uh, to Seattle, 
when I, when I first got married, mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> then, and then it got transferred to uh, Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. before the, uh, well, when I first, uh, my first ship was the carrier Yorktown, okay. and we made a Westpac tour. My second ship was the Wilhoyt, and uh, it was, uh, 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 that was the one I got married. And uh, <clears throat> it was uh, transferred to Pearl Harbor for the last four months of my tour. Oh. And uh, so uh, we, we decided not to save any money, and we saw all the, of the Hawaiian Islands. Oh. We, we toured around whenever the ship was in port. We were three weeks in and three weeks out. Mm -hmm. So you met your wife during your tenure in the Navy in Georgia? Yes. She's from Georgia? Yes. Mm -hmm. You've been married how long? 53 years. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. What does she do? Or what, what did you do together as a young couple? <laughs> well, uh, 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 well, <laughs> Worked a lot. What? You traveled a lot. Oh, uh, yeah. We the military. Yeah, we traveled. We've been in, uh, traveled and I kind of had to count them up one time and we traveled around 33 countries. Wow. And, uh, 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 I was teaching and lecturing and, and uh, uh, all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, in New Zealand and Australia and uh, 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 Europe and, and uh, uh, where we, uh, in Germany and Slovenia mm -hmm. and uh, Moscow and uh, so forth and uh, to name a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we it traveled, and uh, uh, we uh, took trains all over Europe. Mm -hmm. That was a tricky thing. Oh yeah, how so? <laughs> Have to hop off one, get on the next one. Right. In three minutes <laughs> with our luggage. Right. Oh, making that transfer. <laughs> So the lectures you were making during that time, were they related to the research that you did as a student at Indiana University? Well, yes, uh, but uh, they're more broadly uh, related to business valuation. Okay. And, uh, and in fact, uh, Slovenia has uh, uniform standards of professional appraisal practice, mm -hmm. uh, is law in Slovenia now. Hmm. Based on some of the early um, lectures and, and research that you developed? Uh, based on my teaching in Slovenia mm -hmm. and my co-instructor in Slovenia uh, eventually became the finance minister of Slovenia. Wow, and now they have adopted those principles into law. Yeah. That's very impressive. So, so when was that about? When was that? Uh, that was about uh, 15 years ago. And those times you were making the lectures and traveling, um, about what time period was that? Oh, that was uh, all over because I built my business by uh, teaching business valuation through extension programs at universities, literally from the University of Hawaii uh, to the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And uh, I teach a one-day class on uh, uh, how to value a business and in the 70s, and that was, uh, that was the only uh, subject matter on that that was out there. And so I developed my notes and uh, published the first book on business valuation in uh, 1981. Mm -hmm. It's now its fifth edition. And that is valuing a business? Yes. In the 1970s. So that was where the first publication out related to valuing business enterprises. Yes. Before that time, was there, was there any resource for, for valuing a business? Was there any real practice or theory? No. There was one book which uh, lightly touched on the subject. Do you recall what that was? No. I was talking to um, Parnell Black earlier this week, actually, um, and mentioned to him that I'd be here spending some time with you. And he recalled that there were three books at the time when um, NACVA started training. Yours was one. James Schilt? 
yeah. had another. And then the, the Orange Book by Art Crandall. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember those? Yeah. Yours was first to press. Yeah. But um, those resources or those individuals, did, did any of you collaborate at no, all? No, I didn't collaborate with Crandall. I mean, he was a... Uh, uh, he was an, a real advocate uh, for uh, low values, and and uh, uh, and uh, he wasn't really very credible. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the uh, uh, Schilt uh, was—he's uh, uh, gone now, but uh, he was uh, uh, more credible than Crandall. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't recall uh, what he wrote. Mm. So starting with your publication, it, it, it really cracked the door open to methodologies, much yeah. more consistent methodologies to value yeah. businesses. Yeah, and uh, when the, the, we formed the uh, uh, Business Valuation Committee of the American Society of Appraisers mm -hmm. in 1981, and I was on the first uh, uh, Standards Committee, mm -hmm. so we we uh, we got together in Los Angeles at the offices of Claire Donius of Arthur Anderson, mm -hmm. and we thought we we had a stack of sheets that thick uh, mm -hmm. with with each one with a term on it, 400 terms, and we thought we'd get through those on the weekend. Oh my goodness! And uh, well, we discovered uh, that uh, everybody had a different idea. Mm -hmm. And we we got the end of, we ended up the weekend agreeing on about thirty oh, out of about four hundred. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, things have changed, but to some degree, there's still a lot of of varying um, words and definitions that are used. Yes, there are, but uh, it's getting better. Yes, very good, and you kind of help push those things yes, forward. Yes, I'm proud of that. <laughs> so the American Society of Appraisers is really where you started or with the organization that really started with. A um, credential or well, or the Institute of Business Appraisers okay. was started in 1978, mm -hmm. and uh, the American Society of Appraisers was started in 1936, but it didn't form its business valuation committee until 1981. Okay, so the IBA is the longest term organization y yes. that has been specializing in business appraisers yes. and business values. Yes. Um, their certified business appraiser credential. Uh, were you very much involved in helping to establish what was the requirements for that program? Oh, yes, I, I was, uh, and uh, I knew. Uh, well, I, I know Ray Miles very well, and mm -hmm. and uh, he and I are good friends, and and uh, I taught uh, uh, and uh, lectured in many of their classes. Mm -hmm. That program now um, is taking a. Uh, it's its next generation of evolution in that it's partnering with the NACVA to combine the training for both programs, at yeah. least the fundamental training. Yes, I think that's a very good idea. How, why so? Well, because we don't need uh, scattered uh, training. I mean, we should we should have, all have the same training, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we should <clears throat> come together on uh, uh, on on principles and practices and uh, uh, the re amazing amount of redundancy right. between the AICPA and NACFA and the ASA mm -hmm. uh, in the, its courses and I'm glad to see that the NACFA and IBA have combined courses and I understand from you that you're talking about the ASA about uh, more uh, coordinated work with yes. them. We're attempting to, yes. Also recently, um, just this year, the IBA and the NACVA have unified their standards. Yes. And they're all in uniformity with the AICPA's SSVS standards, so there is a lot more harmony yeah. now with the standards of those organizations. Yes, and, and uh, those are uh, all in accordance with the Uniform Standard Professional Appraisal Practice, mm -hmm. which is the daddy of them all. Right, right. So, speaking of all those organizations, the ASA, the IBA, the NACVA, um, there's so many opportunities and resources now for folks to learn about valuation, yes. but early on there wasn't. What was, it was a lot of growth, probably in the late 90s. 
in the profession. It just grew so rapidly. Yes. Um, what were some of the things that you think attributed to the that growth within the profession during that time? Well, the attorneys were were uh, realizing that they're uh, recognizing business appraisal as a profession, and uh, the, that was. Uh, the primary uh, piece of growth because we get most of our business th through attorneys mm -hmm. and um, attorneys recognize the need for valuations and increasingly so. Mm -hmm. For what purposes obviously? Uh, well for all kinds of purposes for mergers and acquisitions and uh, uh, divorces, for gift and estate taxes, mm -hmm. for shareholder disputes. As a matter of fact, 43% of our business last year was shareholder disputes, wow. one kind or another. Man, that's a lot. <laughs> And your your practice is here, headquartered in. in um, well, it's headquartered here, but we practice, practice all over the globally. Globally, yeah. We we, we did uh, uh, one case over in uh, Austria last year. And you were a founder of Willamette Management Associates. Yes. Early on. Yes. Um, tell us about how that's a very still a very prominent firm. Yes. Um, tell us about your time there and, and how you. Well, I started Willamette in uh, uh, 1969, um, and uh, the, we, at that time we were largely uh, doing research for brokerage houses. There were no brokerage house analysts in Portland at that time, and we're we're writing uh, company reports for brokerage publication by brokerage houses and uh, doing work for public companies. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, one day, uh, uh, somebody came to my door and said, "Well, I've my dad died, and I've got an estate." and taxes, mm -hmm. what, what's it worth, and uh, another company come to the door and they'd say, I've got an offer on my table for so much money and I want you to take a look at it. And I suddenly realized that the service of valuing privately held companies was not being well served in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then I decided that we'd make that a major part of our business and to, to the 1970s while I was going back and forth across the country uh, with these talks it grew and uh, by 1980 the private company valuation practice had become over 50 percent of our business and today it's uh, about 85 percent of our business and the other 15 percent various aspects of public companies. That was quick I mean just to define that special to niche um, that had not previously really been carved out. Yeah, and uh, there was a company in uh, New Jersey called Management Planning okay. that was doing it, and there were a couple other companies that were doing it, mm -hmm. but um, it was not well recognized and broadly practiced in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it moved, it grew quickly, and it, and it then expanded. Um, as you taught and trained more, people became more aware of that business opportunity or that specialization opportunity. Yes. Um, so you were with Willamette for a while? Yes. Uh, I started in 1969 and I sold it in 1991 to uh, Robert Riley and mm -hmm. Bob Schweiss. And I worked for them until uh, uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I started the Shannon Pratt Valuations on January 1st, 2004. And you've been here since. You guys are moving pretty soon, huh? Yeah, we're moving down down the street a little ways. Yeah, not too far away. Yeah. How many individuals do you have right now? In we have seven now, and we're looking for an eighth. Oh, well, let's put it out there. Anyone who wants to work for Shannon? You know, let's get your resumes in. You got a tough boss to pitch to, but. A great opportunity. What kind of what kind of things in your practice do you do? You mentioned a, a great portion of your revenues recently was from um, shareholder disputes. Yeah, the shareholder disputes of various kinds. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, from everybody, everything from uh, an ESOP. Uh, employee group uh, saying they were uh, not valued in, in accordance with uh, ESOP regulations to uh, uh, to, to somebody um, uh, 
uh, seeking evaluation under a buy-sell agreement and having a dispute over the value according to the buy-sell agreement. Uh, that's that covers the most uh, of it. Well, on the issue of ESOP, um, recently the Department of Labor is wanting to redefine fiduciary. Um, your partner, your previous partner, Robert Riley, testified on behalf of the AICPA um, on that issue. Are you familiar with what's going on there with, with them wanting to redefine that no. fiduciary? Um, there's going to um, be a recategorization of the individuals who are qualified to do that type of appraisal. Okay. And there was quite a bit of uproar within the profession as to make sure that the analysts and appraisers who are obviously trained and certified in, in, in how to derive values can make sure that their position in that matter is still very um, applicable. Yeah, but uh, we're not fiduciaries. Correct. But we don't want to be fiduciaries. No, no. But to be able to help define or, or support the the um, the uh, deriving those values. Yes. Um, your uh, Robert Riley pr uh, testified for the AICPA on on behalf of the profession to make yeah. sure they were positioned appropriately within yeah. that whole area. Um, what kind of valuation work? Is there any specific area that you enjoy more than others? Well, I uh, enjoy uh, 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 fairness opinions huh. a lot. Uh, uh, um, we haven't done very many fairness opinions as, a, um, as Shannon Pratt evaluations, but I, I think that uh, the investment bankers who do the fairness opinions and take a uh, performance fee on the transaction have a, a big conflict of interest mm -hmm. and I think that the clients would be better served if the, if the fairness opinions were done by independent companies. Mm -hmm. Now NASDAQ has already taken that stand and uh, uh, so mm -hmm. they've merely said that the, <clears throat> the investment banker that's getting the performance fee uh, can't get a, a fee for a fairness opinion, but th then the investment banker just toss the fairness opinions to another investment banker. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think the appraisal profession is better equipped than the investment bankers mm -hmm. to do the uh, fairness opinions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> statistics have shown uh, that there's a great tendency to overpay. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing the fairness opinion on behalf of the sellers, uh, is this normally a slam dunk because mm -hmm. The, the the sellers uh, are normally are getting overpaid, right. but uh, uh, that's not always the case. Uh, I, I had a, a fairness opinion on a bank in a way uh, offered by a very prominent uh, business person in a way for the bank and the directors really wanted to sell it, mm -hmm. and I had to tell them the directors it wasn't fair. Right, a, and, a more realistic value. Yeah, and uh, uh, so. Fortunately, uh, about six months later, they got another offer mm. that was within my range. And mm. So, uh, but fairness opinions uh, are my, uh, I think, my favorite uh, activity. Hmm. What, well, what is your least? I mean, you... My least? Divorces. Divorce, yeah. It's, it's emotionally challenging to yeah. tread through that hole. But we try not to get involved personally with the couples, right. and, right. Uh, and uh, we do about 15% of our book of business is divorces, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and um, we're going through a big one right now. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of unique issues to valuing um, business for um, matrimonial. Right? Yeah. Um, Gift and estate taxes, I like. There's a lot going on in that area right now, too. Yeah. Tell us how you feel about this current political climate and uh, regarding all the estate taxes, the repeal or not, or, or that whole opportunity that's, that's, that's 
well, on the plate right now. I think that uh, the estate tax should not be repealed, and and uh, I think that the uh, uh, income taxes uh, should be much higher at, at at high levels of income, say over a million dollars. Uh, say some of these sports figures, corporate executives, uh, the the the. <clears throat> spread between the lowest class and the highest class in terms of income has widened out in the United States over the last 10 years. And uh, we should be more like uh, New Zealand. We shouldn't be quite as socialistic as New Zealand, but right. we should be much, much more, more even. Mm -hmm. This concludes part one of four conversation with Dr. Shannon Pratt. In part two, Dr. Pratt will be discussing technical valuation issues, the importance of outreach to college and university students, and also giving advice to others who practice in litigation matters.